Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Our review, very important. I mentioned to you that everyone wants to succeed. Nobody wants to fail in life. And I also emphasize that success is predictable. But I also reminded you that so is failure. You can predict failure and success, and there's a reason why. The reason why you can do that is because of number four. Everything in life was designed and created to function by laws. And therefore, laws make life predictable. Laws make life simple. That means that God designed everything in life to function by laws, therefore he designed it to be successful. I also reminded you that your success is good for who? It's good for God. And why is your success good for God? Because of a principle that you need to learn about manufacturing. And that is the success of a product protects the reputation of the manufacturer. So whenever a product fails, that affects the reputation or the name of the manufacturer. Therefore, success is not something you pursue. Success is a result of obedience to those laws. Now, these are very powerful, important principles to remember. Success is not something you try to achieve. This is why most people are not successful. Successful people in history never tried to be successful. They simply focused on pursuing a purpose and then obeying some laws. Now that leads me then to the question again, what is success? Success is not what you've done compared to what others have done. Success is what you've done compared to what you knew you could have done or you should have done. So success has more to do with fulfilling your assignment and your purpose than it has to do with beating someone else in a race. So it's important for you to understand that success is very, very personal, nothing to do with other people. So success in life is discovering two things, your purpose and your assignment. We're going to talk about how that works tonight. Success, therefore, is fulfillment and completion of your purpose. Purpose is the reason why a thing was created. A trumpet is successful when it blows a note. So a trumpet on display in your home on the table is not successful. It's beautiful, it's a nice place to put it, but it's a failure. Why? Because the purpose for a trumpet is to blow a note, not for display. A piano in your home for 40 years, unplayed, has made that piano unsuccessful. Even though it's beautiful and it makes your home look distinguished, that piano is a failure because it was not created for a furniture piece. It was created to do what? Produce music. So purpose determines success. So dressing up nice and wearing expensive clothes is simply a well-dressed failure. If you didn't do what you were born to do and you dressed up, you are a well-dressed disgrace to the manufacturer. So life is not about how you dress or how expensive your shoe is. What's important to life is, are you doing what you were born to do? And this is why most people are failing in life. They have not captured yet what they were born to do. Now in Matthew chapter 13, this is our theme we focused on, Jesus talked about when you live in a kingdom, your success is related to some keys, and he calls them secrets. And he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Those secrets are called keys. In Matthew 16, verse 19, we referred to this in our last segment. I want to read it again. He says, I will give you what? The keys, plural, 
of the kingdom. There's no key to the kingdom. There are keys, many of them, of the kingdom. Why is this so important? He said, because these keys open up heaven or close heaven. They open up life or close life. In other words, keys are determining whether you live a lock-up life or an open life, whether you succeed or fail. Now, what are keys? Keys are laws, principles or precepts. They are systems that you use. When you go to a locked door with a key, you are taking a law that makes the door submit and it opens the door. That's what Christ meant when he used the word keys. Keys are systems or laws by which everything functions. Now, I want to give you then an important concept of keys that we dealt with in the last segment. And it's important to repeat it. Keys are principles or laws. Here's some things about principles and laws that you need to remember. Number one, principles and laws are universal. That is important because that means you don't need to change your country to be successful. A lot of people think if I can just make it to a certain country, I'll make it in life. I have gone to countries where people have left their homes and today they are sweeping the streets in that country and they have a lower job in that country than they had in their former country. And some of those people having to go back to their countries because they thought that, that uh, you know, the, the country determined their success. Some of you think if you were to leave the Bahamas and go to America, you'll make it. Believe me, it's not a matter of where you are located. The issue is, do you know the laws of success? Secondly, principles and laws are permanent. That means they are the same for Moses as they are for you today. Laws do not change. Number three, principles and laws work everywhere and anywhere. Again, that's important. They work in the midst of a crisis or they work where there is no crisis. They work anywhere, anytime. Number four, principles and laws are not partial. That means laws don't work for certain race of people and then don't work for some other race of people. Laws work for all people. Laws don't work for fat people or skinny people or cute people or white people or black people. Laws work for people if the people work the laws. Number five, principles and laws guarantee success. The only way that you can guarantee something if you follow its instructions. And this is why, again, success is predictable. You can guarantee results if you follow the laws. If you are failing in your life, try and study what laws you are violating. If you are succeeding in life, study the laws you are obeying. There's no mystery to life. And most of us are hoping to succeed in life and don't understand the laws that are established by God to succeed. Principle number six, principles and laws never can be broken. Why? You cannot break a law. The law breaks you. Don't think you can violate a law and still be successful. It's like running a red light hoping you won't get an accident. You know, you break laws, then they break you. So if you want to be successful, don't try to take shortcuts. Don't try to find your way of doing things. There are laws established in life by the creator that everyone has to follow. And anyone who follows those laws have the same results. That means point number seven. Principles and laws are inherent and their judgment is inherent. That means that you don't need to be punished if you violate a law. The punishment is in the law. If you put your hand in fire, no one has to burn you. You violate a law, you get burned. And so it is with everything in life. God doesn't really judge us. The laws he built into life judges us. You have sex. Well, you get pregnant. Who do you blame? Well, you violate a law of fidelity or the law of self-control. And now the judgment is built in. You have conceived a child. And now you want to create another law of violating that baby by committing adultery. 
And now you kick in a judgment of guilt for the rest of your life. Because that child might have been like Miles Monroe. So now you sit around with this guilt because you violated law after law after law. The way you fix that is you decide, I'll never break another law again. That leads to point number eight. Principles and laws protect the product. When you obey the laws laid down by the manufacturer, you don't need to worry about protection. They protect you. Do not fornicate. Well, you can never be pregnant if you don't fornicate. It protects you. You don't got to wonder whether, I wonder if I'm pregnant. I wonder if I'm pregnant. Well, if you had sex, you better wonder all night. But if you never had sex, you can't be pregnant. So the protection counts in obedience to the law. When you stop at a red light, you don't need to worry about getting arrested. The protection is in the law. So guilt comes when you break a law because you're no longer protected by that law. So it is in life with success. Now, that takes me to my point here dealing with God's economic plan. I want to just read this verse again because we're going to zero in on these four principles of God's plan for your prosperity. Now, people want to know, does God want you to be successful and prosperous? Let's read Deuteronomy 8 verse 17. You may say to yourself, God says, my power and the strength of my hand has produced this wealth for me. But you must remember, the Lord your God, it is he who gave you the ability to produce wealth to confirm his covenant that he made to your fathers. God is not against you becoming wealthy, but he wants you to remember where it came from. Secondly, this verse tells us how to become wealthy. And wealth in this verse doesn't come from God in the sense that God gives you money. Read it carefully. What does God give you? The ability to produce. Write that down. Wealth comes from finding your ability to produce something. The word ability here actually means ideas. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, how do you get to work out or produce? Produce means to actually work something out or to express something. The first command that God gave man was to work. Uh, work shows up in the Bible before a woman. And that's because a man needs work before a woman. The word work is what I call the law of work. Everybody says law of work. Now remember we're talking about laws. Work is a law. That means anything that stops you from working violates a law. So if you want to get something without effort, you're violating a law. If you want something free, you are violating a law. That's why God doesn't like beggars. A beggar is somebody who wants something without effort. Let me quote the King David says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. Notice the condition, righteous. What is righteous? Staying in line with the laws. He said, if you stay in line with the laws, you will never be a beggar. Why? A beggar is not a worker. And the first law God gave man was to work. Matter of fact, let's read it. Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. And he commanded the man to what? To work. And to care for it. First command of God, work. Everybody say work. Say it loud. Work is not a curse. The curse occurs in chapter 3. The curse is not work. Work shows up in chapter 2 of Genesis. No devil, no sin, no demon. And God says work. Why? Because work is the reason why you were created. Let me explain what I mean. The word work is the word eragon in, in, in Greek and Hebrew, uh, the transliteration of the word eragon. And the word actually means to become. The word work also means to work out something, to become what you are. I tried to explain this in the last session. For example, uh, it's like talking to a seed to become. What's in a seed? A forest. Trees. So when you tell the tree, work, you're telling the tree, become what you already are. That's the word for work. So when God told Adam, work, he was telling Adam, become what's trapped on the inside. So work is not something that the government provides. And that's why you're broke. 
you're looking for jobs. You're waiting for some investor to come and give you a job. If the investor doesn't come, you can't find a job, you can't pay your bills, you kicked out of your home, and you can't work. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why it's so important for you to remember that work has nothing to do with your understanding. Let me just get rid of this for a second. Work has nothing to do with your finding a job. Work has to do with finding who you're supposed to become. Is that clear? That's the word for work. I am successful because I'm not doing something. I am becoming something. Write this down, please. Very important. Work is like a seed becoming a tree. It's like a, it's like a bird flying. A bird was designed to fly. That's his work. So when a bird is flying, you can actually say the bird is working. When a tree comes out of a seed, you can say the seed is working. When a fish is swimming, you can say the fish is working. Why? It's becoming what it is. Therefore, work is like a seed becoming a tree. Now, let me just say this quickly. Not all jobs are your work. Most people go to a place where they can't become. Why? Because you are restricted by what the job tells you to do and what you cannot do. And this is why most people hate their jobs. Because their jobs actually suffocate their real gift. And so they find themselves hating Monday mornings, going to a place they don't like, and they can't wait to leave it because it's like a bird trapped in a cage for eight hours. Why? Because you are not really working. You have a job. Your job, therefore, will never be your work because it traps you. Your work can become your job if you find your work in your job. In other words, if you have a job where you are becoming, then you are not on a job. You're going to work. It's like a singer who was born to sing and he has a singing business, a job. Well, he's not going to work. He's not going to a job, rather. He's going to work every day. Let me, let me say something very interesting. Jesus said all the time, I work the work of him that sent me. And then he says, I do the work of him who sent me. And then he says, my father works, therefore I work, and I came to work the work that the father gave me to do. He never says job. Jesus had a job, you know. His job was a carpenter. His work was redeemer. He said, I didn't come to be a carpenter. I came really to redeem the world. That's my work. And my work is to do what? The will of my father. That's an important statement. My work is to do what? The will. What is will? The original intent of the manufacturer who sent me. So work is becoming what you were born to be. And work, therefore, can become your job if you are doing in your job what you were born to do. Is that clear? And this is, by the way, this is why most jobs kill people. Jobs can kill you because you can actually be trapped in a place for 40 years, suffocating your life and living in bitterness and hatred and anger, and you are always irritated because you are in a place you don't want to be and don't like to be, and therefore you hate everybody every day for 40 years. And the Bible says what? Bitterness dries up the bones. That means it creates cancer. You ever hear people say, this job is killing me? They are correct. So I've come to you in this session to tell you how to be free from your job so you can find your work because your prosperity is not in your job. Your prosperity is in your work. And just explain how that works now. Okay, write this down, please. Your goal in life is not to be employed. Say that with me. My goal in life is not to be employed. Say it again. Can you write that down, please? I want you to write it down and look at it for a second. <laughs> the number one promise of your governments is jobs. So your goal is to get a job. The young man here tonight comes out of high school. First thing he's told, 
go get a job. They never say go get a business. The guy who just comes out of college, this lady with a PhD or a master's degree, comes back home, first attempt, got to find a job. It's as if we believe we were born to be employed. But I want to change your thinking tonight, write a new word down. You were born to be deployed. Everybody say deployed. Say it again, deployed. Employment means somebody else controls you. Deployment means you release what's on the inside of you. Those who deploy themselves employ others. <laughs> Deployers employ. If you're tired of being employed, focus on being a deployer. I'm going to explain what a deployer is in a minute. But that's where your wealth is. Those who deploy themselves determine their own value. Those who are employed, their value is determined by the one who employed them. <laughs> so a salary is really someone else's opinion of how much you are worth. When you deploy yourself, you establish your own worth. So a job is employment. Work is deployment. Employment prepares you for deployment. When you go to a job, always remember this is temporary. I am going to use this opportunity to deploy myself. In other words, deployment activates your gifts and energizes your life, not employment. People who are employed are always complaining. Don't look now, you're sitting next to one. You know, this whole stupid job, I'm tired of being here. These folks don't trust me. They don't know what I'm worth. They don't understand me. I, well, I, I hate this place. They, they're not, I'm supposed to be raised. How come I'm getting no raise? I, I ain't getting promoted. I mean, they spend years just employed and, and complaining while they are employed. And, and the complaint is coming from the fact that their gift is not being activated. Therefore, there's no excitement and no energy in their lives. When you go to a place where your juices come out, where you can release all the desires and the gifts on the inside. You can't wait to get there. As a matter of fact, 5 o'clock becomes depressing when you are in your work. You don't want to leave it. You know, birds don't get tired flying. Did you know that scientists have discovered that birds get energy from flight and that fish get energy from swimming? That means if what you are doing are wearing you out, then that's a sign that you are not in your work. A person who is in their gift hates sunsets. Why? They want the day to be longer because they can't wait to stay in what they're doing. But if you can't wait for 5 o'clock, you watch your clock from 3 o'clock till 5. It's a, it's a, yeah, that means you are not in your work yet. You are on a job. You are employed and not deployed. Write this down. Deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world. Deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world. They asked Michael Jackson one time, uh, why do you love singing so much? He said, because singing is me. It is me. And that's true. Remember, work is what you want. It's becoming what you are. So he... He, he called it going to work. Singing is not a job to a real singer. <laughs> so when you find your gift, when you find your, your, your deployment, you actually find the gift you serve to the world. And the world will pay you for being yourself. <laughs> Can you imagine getting paid for something you like to do? That's why people who live long are usually those who have found something that they can't wait to do in the morning because it's good for your health it, it gives you actually your adrenaline begins to get higher and your your systems of throwing against uh, disease is so high because your immune system actually finds strength from a good attitude 
protects you from getting sick. Remember, jobs do kill. Make a note of this. Your future is in your seed gift. It's not in your job. It's in the gift that you have. So let me put this this way then. I'm going to now talk about then the difference between your work and your job. Very quickly, please make notes here. First of all, think beyond your job. Say that with me. Think beyond your job. Say it loud. Think beyond your job. Tell your neighbor right in their face. Think beyond your job. Listen, most people are depressed when they get fired because they did not think beyond their jobs. There's life after your job. There's life after retirement. And believe me, nothing is more dangerous today than retiring. Because, you know, when your great-grandfather used to retire, you know, you, you retired at 65 and you're dead at 70. Today, because of the increase in medical science, you can live to be 80 to 85 average. If you retire at 60, how many years you got left? 25 years more and you are retired. What are you going to do for another quarter of your life? Therefore, you cannot put your hope in a job. And let me tell you something right away. The company you work for, the minute you hit 65, they already start singing the hymns. <laughs> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Why? You're 65. They already see the young guy come out of college who want to actually work for less. You with me? The older you are, the more expensive you are to the company. So wake up and think beyond your job. That means that the solution to your future success is not in the job you have, it's in what you're thinking beyond the job. And that's why I'm here in this session. Make a note of this. There's no future in any job. I guess those who got fired proved that, right? You got laid off. Or, or they only got you on two days work. You realize your future is being attacked by the fact that they laid you off. So you got to cut back on your standard of living. Maybe even lose a car and lose a house. Why? Because your future, you put in your job. No job has a future in it. Make a note of this please. The future is in the one who holds the job. Don't ever allow an organization to be your hope. Every job is temporary. No matter how much they praise you and love you, <laughs> you better think beyond that position. Because when this thing is all over, they will tell you bye-bye. There are folks in this room who have been retired for five years already, and they begin to scratch their heads. Why did I retire? Because life goes on. I'm glad you're here. And young people, please remember what I'm saying because you got a chance to not make mistakes that older people have made. Write this down, please. Create your business in your job. Now, I'm going to explain this in a minute, how this works, because you must make yourself indispensable by refining the value you are to that job. Now, you can't really depend on a job, but you can actually make yourself so valuable that you're the last one they want to let go. And how do you make yourself valuable to a job? You become indispensable. How? By refining your gift on the job. In other words, you make yourself so important to the company by investing in your own gift that they don't want you to go. You know, every job I've ever had, if I can remember far back as I can, they always wanted me to stay. The last one I resigned from was from the government. I used to work for the Ministry of Education. Then I was moved down to public, public personnel. And I worked with the Deputy Prime Minister years ago, uh, the late Sir Clement Maynard. And I resigned five times. Why? They kept refusing my resignation. Why? They said, we don't want you to leave the system because you work effectively, they said. You remember Daniel? You should read the book of Daniel sometime. Daniel made himself so valuable, the king said he was an excellent worker and no one wanted to get rid of Daniel. There are some people who can't wait till you leave. Why? You're not an asset. You are a deficit of the company. There are supervisors praying for you to resign. Why? You are not a, a, a help to the company. You don't, you've made yourself a problem rather than a solution. 
When there's a downsizing taking place in an economy like this, the first person to let go is the one who caused all the problems. That's probably why some people are fired, because you, you, you think it was... No, they, were, they, are, they are happy for the crisis. Why? Finally can get rid of you legally and give a reason for it. Yeah, because you made yourself a nuisance. But if you make yourself indispensable by serving your gift with quality and becoming more and more valuable by solving problems for people, they won't let you go. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you before we end this session that the key to becoming prosperous is solving problems. You are kept for the problems you solved. You are let go for the problems you create. People ask me all the time, how are you doing? My answer is, I'm a solution, not a problem. And I mean that. I said to myself all the time, I solve problems. That's why I'm valuable. I'm valuable because I'm solving your problems tonight. If you want to become the same way, you got to be able to find problems that you can solve and then solve them. Don't look for a job. Look for a problem. People are looking for money. Don't look for money. Look for a problem. You solve problems, you get paid. So that's different between your job and your work. Let me give you the differences real quick. Never confuse your job with your work. Why? Your job is what they train you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Your job is your career. Your work is your life assignment. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. You know why they let people go during the crisis? Because your skill come a dime a dozen. They could fire you because they don't need your skill, but they can never fire your gift. It goes with you. A person who knows their gift can never get fired. <laughs> this is why you have to study what is my gift. Now, our problem is our cultures have not trained us to find a gift. They train us to find a job. So they tell you, go get a skill. Remember those words? The problem is, your skill is dispensable. Who told you I can need your skill all along? Plus, if I've been using your skill for 20 years, and now you are making $20,000 a year, and a young guy came out of college with a more refined skill in your area. He only wants 25. You're gone. In other words, skills are dispensable. But gifts can never be taken away. Write this down, please. Your work, you can retire from your job, but you can't retire from your work. I've never seen a fish who says, I tired swimming. <laughs> I retire. I don't, I don't swim no more. I've never seen a bird that says, I, I retire from flying. I've never seen a seed that says, I retire from bringing forth a tree. In other words, you never retire from your gift. You can retire from your work, from your job, rather, from your skill. And many people in this room are actually suffering right now because they retired from their skill. You are you as a secretary, no one wants you anymore. You're a skillful secretary, but they don't want secretaries. So your skill has become your curse. 20 years of experience as a secretary. I mean, you know everything about clerical stuff. The people don't want your skill. So you better find something else, which is your gift. Make a note of this, please. Jobs prepare you for your work. Say it loud. Jobs prepare you for your work. While you are on a job, learn as much as you can, because my justification for a job is simple. Jobs are opportunities where you are paid to learn. Can I say it again? Jobs are gifts that God gave you to be paid to learn. Don't always try to get a job you really want. Get the one that's available. And don't always think you want a job that will only suit what you really like to do. Get a job that's available. Why? Let them pay you to learn some new skills some new experiences, to meet some new people. How many people have helped me who I used to work with years ago and that relationship still lasts and now they are managers of a bank and we used to work in a warehouse together. So now that relationship has actually opened doors for me to get a loan because I worked at that warehouse. 
My friend is the manager. See, sometimes your job is not to give you money, it's to give you relationships. So don't always go for a job because of money. Most folks don't have a job today because they're looking for the right money. It ain't money that brings the job importance. What makes the job important is that you can get paid to learn something and to also learn people. Is this clear? All right. Make a note of this, please. The power of work. Jobs are temporary, but work is permanent. You know, the, the work of a fish is swimming. <laughs> swimming in a certain part of the, the pool is his job. If you took the fish out of the pool and put him in a pond, have you taken away his ability to swim? His gift went with him, even though you fired him from the, from the pool. See, when they get rid of you, carry a gift with you. Wherever you land, keep on swimming. Because it wasn't the skill that they took away from you. It was the location for you to be in your gift. No matter where I am for the rest of my life, I can never be poor again. Because I've discovered my gift. I will not allow my country or my culture to determine my value anymore in my life. No one will ever determine how much I'm worth anymore. And you've got to get to the point where you are free from the spirit of jobs. And you ignite the spirit of work. And use every job to refine your work. Make a note of this, please. You can never retire from your job. From your, from your work, rather. But you can retire from your job. Retirement is not in the Bible. It's a capitalist concept. Retirement is not even biblical. You are never supposed to retire. You're supposed to simply finish your work and leave. I have finished my course. I, I, Paul never retired. Christ said, it is finished. He didn't retire. You leave after you finish something. Some of the most miserable people in the world are retired people. Do you know why? You were never created to stop working. What is work? Becoming. If you stop becoming, you stop existing. No wonder why you're so paranoid and hate everybody. Because you ain't being yourself lately. People who live long are those who have found something that they love to do all their lives. If you can't wait to get rid of your job, it's because it's not your work. Number four, your work protects you from your job. Write that down. If you learn your work, you're not afraid if they take away your job. When they threaten to fire you, you should say, it's okay. Why? You can take away my job, but you can't take away my work. You can take away my skill, but you can't take away my gift. You can take away the activity. You can't take away the ability. Your gift is more important than your skill. And number five, write it down, please. Your work is your seed. We're getting into deep stuff now. Everybody say seed. Your work is your seed. What do I mean by that? Let's talk about this for a minute. The most important verse in the Bible that I've ever read that set me free from employment is this one. It was read tonight. As a matter of fact, uh, I was showing Pastor Roll my Bible tonight. How many of you have an NIV? Hold it up, please. An NIV Bible. Come on, Freeport, hold it up. Anyone got an NIV? New International Version. Hold it up in there. NIV. Now, I told you all a long time ago to buy the NIV. Some of you all still got the King James. The NIV is probably the best translation I know because the scholars were honest. The work they did in the translation of the Hebrew and the Greek is one of the best in history. Let me read, please turn your Bibles to 11, chapter of Ecclesiastes. Let me show you the difference between the NIV and your Bible. Big difference. NIV says, verse 1 of 11, Ecclesiastes, verse 1. Ship your grain across the sea. What does your King James say? Cast your bread upon. See, completely different. In Hebrew, it means ship your grain across the sea. That means become an exporter. Next verse. After many days, you may receive a return. A return means dividends. You get a return on your investment. This chapter is about business. Not about a loaf of bread. 
ship your grain where? Across the sea. Now, this is completely opposite to what the Bahamas is doing. We're not shipping grain across the sea. We are importing the grain. So someone else is getting the return. Hmm. What I have done is exactly what this says. My books and CDs and DVDs and my life is always being shipped across the oceans. So I'm getting the returns on that shipment. In other words, you're not supposed to be a consumer. You're supposed to be a producer. I will give you the ability to produce wealth. The exporter will always be richer than the importer. The Bible says don't put all your eggs in one basket. You got this one job. <laughs> you are a barber, okay? You're a barber. Brother Smith is a barber. Suppose Brother Smith broke his hands. Fell down and broke his two hands. The barbering is gone. So what he should do is actually go beyond barbering. He should now import hair products just in case his hand get broken. He can sell products. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, it says. You carpenter, your hands are important to you. Break both of your wrists. It's over. So you better learn to import furniture while you're a carpenter and learn how to get in touch with those who, who, who you buy wood from. Say, I'm going to be a wood supplier just in case my hand broke. I sell wood to the other carpenters. I don't need my hand to sell wood. In other words, seven, invest in seven ventures, it says. But I won't get to that, you know. Let's get down to this verse. By the way, I think I, think I better read this part here. Verse 4, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Those who watch the wind means waiting for luck. That word wind means luck in Hebrew. Those who are waiting for luck. You are smiling. I wonder why you are smiling. It said those who watch the wind will not plant. That means they will not go out and work. They play, play numbers all day. They borrowed a plant. Listen, this ain't funny. He says, this is why we, this is why we poor. He who watches the wind, who watches for luck, will not work, he says. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in the womb, so you cannot understand the works of God, the maker of all things, said, therefore, this verse, sow your seed, where? In the morning and in the evening, let not your hands be idle. That's the verse you must remember. Sow your seed when? In the morning. And in the evening, let not your hands be idle. Listen to the Bible. This is the best advice I ever heard in my life. BFM was built after 5 p.m. This place, that's worth millions, was built after 5 p.m. I had a job. Henry had a job. Richard had a job. We used to meet after 5 p.m. Work till 2 a.m. in the morning. Building this. Why? Sow your seed in the morning. That means go to your job in the morning. What's the next verse? Read it. And in the evening, don't turn on the TV and watch two as a company. Or is it Three. Don't watch friends. Don't, in other words, the guys who you're watching already with Rich. He said, when you go home, don't watch TV. Keep working. From 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. is the other man's work. And that's why you're broke. Because from 5 p.m. to 12 midnight, you're watching TV, eating potato chips. The Bible says, no, when evening comes, let not your hands be idle. I do more work while you are sleeping than when you are awake. I guarantee it. 
My wife will tell you that I always say put in after 12 midnight. The books I write, I write while you're sleeping. People say, how can you write books? While you're sleeping. You, the Bible says if you fall in love with sleep, you shall grow poor. The Bible says that. I got to go to bed at 8 o'clock. You will never be wealthy. Because the 8 hours from 8 a.m. doesn't belong to you. They tell you when to come, where to do, where to go, what to do, when to go to lunch, when to come back, and they control your entire life. That means the only life you own is after 5. You can never grow from 8 to 5. You grow in your own time. You can't read books on the man's job. You can't experiment with ideas on the man's job. He got you locked down. Remember, you are a bird in a cage. What do you do when you leave work, you call it? He says, you don't know which one will profit you, whether both equally as well. Let me put it this way. Write this down. Jobs were given to prepare you for your work. He said, go to work in the morning. And when you get off, keep working. Work on your gift after 5 p.m. Work on your skill at 8 a.m. Give them your skill at 8 a.m. Release your gift at 5 p.m. That's the key to your success and your, pro your prosperity. Make a note of this. Fulfillment is discovered when your job becomes your work. You can actually work yourself out of your job. That is what we did here at this ministry. And I've done it actually to, so well that I don't get no pay from this ministry anymore. Why? You can work yourself out of your job. Your work can become so powerful you don't need, you don't need your job anymore. But your work doesn't take place on the man's job. What are you doing after five? Your culture says, go home and rest. The Bible says, let not your hands be idle. The culture says, go lay off and drink some switcher and watch TV. The, the Bible says, let not your hands be idle. Anyone in this room who's a business person will tell you that... <laughs> You don't want to go into business. You think you want to go into business. Business people who don't, don't sleep, they just rest for a few hours. Because they have found something more important than a job. Can I put it this way? Write this down. Success comes after sunset. That's when it really comes. You read all, this, all the books on success, they'll tell you that people who succeed was succeeding while you were sleeping. What do you do? Write a cookbook, man. And I'm going to take days and years and months to do that in the night. But don't just sit there and watch TV. Produce a cookbook. You're a chef, man. Produce a cookbook. That cookbook will be published. You'll be on Chopped. You don't have no idea. You have no idea. You don't, you don't know that. So why waste your time watching TV when you can actually produce something that can be published and go around the world like me? The royalties that pay your life off. You can just have a job or you can get into your work after five. Every one of you, I can tell you right now, each one of you, an idea that you could pay me for. Of what you're doing. What you're doing right now is not what you could do. But you got to pay me to give you the idea. You come to me, I counsel you. I'll give you consultancy. I'll show you what I get paid for. Why? Because what you're doing ain't nothing compared to what you could do. But your culture says, go home and rest. God says, go home. And keep working. Success after five. I remind myself again. Let's read together loud. Go. Sow your seed in the morning. And at evening, let not your hands be idle. Why? Because you do not know which will succeed. Whether this one or that one or both. Can you imagine that? That means you can have a job after the job and both bringing in thousands of dollars. We've been taught, no, get a job, settle down, die, get buried. You know, this is what they told us. And the Bible is saying, no, there's life after five. Hmm. Is this good? 
I want you to think about this. What do you work on after five? Your gift. Proverbs chapter 19, chapter 18, rather, verse 16 says, A man's gift makes room for him in the world, not a man's education. You got a PhD and you still broke. Why? Because the PhD doesn't make you wealthy. As a matter of fact, most PhDs are hired for those, by those who dropped out of school. Let me say it again. Most PhDs are working for those who dropped out of school. Because the person who didn't get a PhD got an idea. And they employed a guy with a PhD. It's not your education that brings you before a great man. It's your gift. Bill Gates dropped out of school. You know, his teachers actually thought that he was mentally damaged because he could never pay attention in class. I read his story. Matter of fact, uh, he said the reason why he couldn't pay attention in class is because he was always ahead of the teacher. They thought he had, you know, learning disorder. You know, he had a disorder of learning too much, too fast. The teacher was always behind him. And they actually sent him for psychological analysis. They thought he was crazy. So he quit school. Started Microsoft. Went to IBM, tried to give them some ideas. They said, you're crazy. So now they use his ideas in their computer, and he gets billions of dollars. Stephen Jobs, what a guy. Quit college, built a, 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 a computer in his garage. Now he employs all the PhDs, even in his death. See, you've been told, get an education, get a job, pay bills, and die. And here I come telling you, no. Find your gift, de de deploy your gift, become wealthy, and live. And bless the world. And employ people and help them. <laughs> your gift. Your gift is more important than your skill. Now here's something I want you to remember. Write this down. You always have what you were born with. You're not born with skills. You have to learn to be a carpenter. <laughs> so there's something more important than being a carpenter. You've got to find your gift. Because your gift will outlast your skill. There can become a day where you can become so feeble you can't handle a hammer. What you can do after that? You're still alive. Number two, you can never lose what you were born with. Number three, your future is not ahead of you. It's trapped on the inside of you. Therefore, you were born with seed. You don't go looking for it. So the key to your life is discovering and developing and serving your seed gift to the world. Always look for the other thing in your life. It's there, you know. Just look for it. It's always with you. But no one ever told you this until I come into your life tonight. To tell you, don't trust their jobs. The crisis is because you lived on the jobs. The crisis is because you depended on the jobs. The crisis came because you depended on the clients. And they don't come no more. God have mercy on us. There's hope. Yes, the hope. Seeds are never in recession. Isn't that beautiful? When I went to Haiti for the first time, I saw plants growing. I was shocked. Because the United Nations, based on their statistics, say that Haiti is the poorest country in the world. The only problem is no one told the seeds. Got my point? The seeds don't care what's the poorest country in the world. They're going to grow once they get the right environment. That means you ain't supposed to care what they say about the crisis. Once you get the right environment, you're going to bring forth. You're going to grow. <laughs> Seeds are never in recession. Gifts are never in recession. Jobs are in recession. But not work. Hallelujah. There's something that's bigger than you. And it's inside of you. When I was praying for tonight, I was praying that God would ask me. I was asking, I said, God, show me how to get on the inside of the place and yuck it up. 
yuck yeah how to get inside your spirit and yuck up your gift and let you see it this is you you are not what they call you they give you titles don't trust their titles find your gift your seeds are never in recession my friends let me give you these last points before I get to the four principles two words one employment what is employment Bahamians please write this down employment is the opportunity to serve your gift in the context of a corporate group and usually you benefit other people deployment is different deployment is the discovery of your gift and serving your gift to your generation You can be deployed or employed. You can deploy your gift in the context of other people's control, or you can deploy your gift to your whole generation, and they will bless you. When you begin to see life beyond your career, beyond your skill, you become a generational changer. This is the difference between employment and deployment. And I challenge you tonight to think about where you are in your life. Your age, whether you are young or old. Think about where am I in the scheme of this teaching? What's happening to my life? How many more years I could have left? Some of you are, are divorcees. Some of you are widows or widowers. And you, you, your life is at a point where you say, what am I supposed to do next? And God says, I'm going to tell you tonight. Find your gift. Serve it. You and I were created to be employed. God created seeds to bring forth trees. He created birds to fly. He created fish to swim. He created you to bring forth. There's something that made him create you. And that thing is the key to your prosperity. Now I'm going to give you my secret. The secret law of success. How do you become successful? Here's my answer. If you want to be successful, do not seek success. Can you write that down, please? Put it on your mirror where you fix your face. If you want to be successful, do not seek success. So what do you do? You seek to become a person of value. That's the key to your prosperity. You seek to become a person of value. The person who becomes successful and prosperous is the person everybody wants to go to to get something done. <laughs> you know the safest business in the world is undertaking being undertaker why people die in every day so the guy meets a need he got you covered he made himself what valuable why do you go to the dentist even if you have a recession because the dentist made himself valuable Eight years of study. Why do you go to a doctor and give him your money in the middle of a recession? Because the doctor spent 14 years specializing in something. He made himself valuable. He refined a gift. <laughs> Why do you take your money to the lawyer? Because the lawyer spent six years refining the law. And so you take your money and give it to the lawyer. Why? The lawyer made himself or herself valuable. Question. Here's the question. Why should I come to you? How you answer that question tells me if you're going to make it. Here's a question more difficult. Why should I come and bring my money to you? 
What is it that you have refined that make me find you? The secret of success, becoming valuable. So here's the process of becoming valuable. I'll give you the secret. Number one, to become valuable, first, you must de determine what your gift is. Some people may have one or two, like me, you know, I have three or four gifts. I, that was my problem most of my life until I figured it out. You know, you got to choose one and focus on it. But I got a lot of gifts. I'm a, I'm a musician, naturally. You know, I'm a writer. I'm a public speaker. I am able to actually uh, pr produce music. I can do a lot of stuff. I have to decide which one I'm going to focus on, that's all. Listen, you don't want to be a jack of all trades and master nothing. Write this down. You are paid for what you master. People ain't looking for you who's a general contractor. Some of them wonder why they can't find jobs. You're too general. <laughs> you better find a specific area that you focus on. Where they're going to need you. They come look for you. Don't just be a carpenter. Find a niche. I'm the creator of bookshelves only. And put it out there. You will see business coming to you like crazy. If you say, I'm just a carpenter, hey, a tile, tile, dime a dozen. And they start comparing you to others. But if you only make shelves, bookshelves, they can't compare because not everybody just makes bookshelves, you see. And now you become valuable because you have what? Become a refined gift. That means you become significant. Significance makes you valuable. Significance means you are different from the others. Everybody sells shoes, fine. A lady came one time, she said, Pastor Miles, I want to open a shoe store. I say, don't. She said, why? I say, everybody's selling shoes. She said, but, so what do you advise? My, my advice is, that, I said, now this is free. Only sell baby shoes from zero to five. You'll make it. Today, she has one of the largest shoe stores in New Jersey. People fly from different parts of the state to buy shoes. Why? They ain't got to wonder if their baby shoes in that store. Of course, she ain't pay me nothing. In other words, you can't just sell something. Sell one thing that is you. Uniqueness. That leads to point number four. Everyone's created to born and born with a unique gift that makes them valuable. That means your success is in your gift of value. There's something that you were born with that other people don't have the way you have it. Everybody's selling cell phones. So why are you going to cell phones? You better find a different type of cell phone just to sell, that's all. In other words, uniqueness makes you valuable. What did I say? Okay, you cosmetologist. You're going, you, you, you going broke, I'm telling you. You better find a unique cosmetological, that's a big word, <laughs> pers perspective where you offer something that others don't offer. You know, one time me, me my wife went to, my wife went to Monte Carlo. Went to Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo. Man, that's where all the big muckamucks are. And we went into a store where, you know, one pair of shoes is $5,000. We went in there, the, the rug in the store was white. Thick white rug in the store. You, not, in other words, don't come in here if you got dirty shoes. And you, it, it, this was a, a clothing store. No clothes were seen. All the clothes upstairs had hidden away. And then they ask you, can I help you? Can we walk in? They say, come, please have a seat. They sit us down at a beautiful glass table. They serve us tea and cookies. I just come to buy, you know, clothing. They say, no, you ain't come here for no clothing. You come in here for an experience. What a store that was. By the time they finished whining and dining you, they said, uh, come upstairs and see our wares. Walk up there, everything in these little private little boots. I tell, my, I tell my wife now, you know, go for the cheapest thing here because this, this, this is a rough place. I saw one dress, it say 28,000. I said, oh yeah. Mm -hmm, honey, come on this side over here. Walk over here, there was a belt. The belt was $400. I said, yeah, that belt must just feed you. And like I saw a purse, $5,500. Just a little purse. I said, take me to the wrong store. 
But we done, we already drained the tea and ate the cookies. <laughs> we had to buy something. You remember that store, baby? It was a rough store. We had to buy something. My point is, they were unique. That's why people fly all over the world, come to that one store and buy one dress. Now, here you are trying to make $5,000 a month in your store. They make $5,000 on one dress. Because they're not selling dresses. You all should pay me for this tonight. You want a restaurant? Okay, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to make it. Everybody, restaurant open today, close tomorrow. You know that, right? Yeah, why? Because they don't understand what I'm teaching. You can buy a sandwich anywhere. People don't buy sandwiches. They buy experiences. Why would you go to a restaurant on Paradise Island and pay $98 for a chicken and buy the same chicken at Dirty's for how much? $5. Same chicken, you know, same chicken. Why? You're not buying chicken on Paradise Island. You're buying a unique experience. That's what makes it valuable. They can, you know, you get chicken anywhere, but you can't get the experience where the guy take the napkin, put it on your lap, bam, and then he pour your water for you and then take it away to make sure you don't pour it by yourself. Understand? And they serve you one course at a time. So it is everything in the bag. Boom, 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 boom. No, 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 no. We separate each chip from each other in this restaurant. See, you eat one chip at a time. You wonder, what am I doing here? You are buying an experience. Here's my question. Why should I come to you? What makes you as a lawyer different? What makes you different as a lawyer? If I come to your lawyer's office, I mean, what, what experience do I have? What, what makes me want to come back? Not, not for law, I get law anywhere. What makes me want to come back to you is the question. Is this good stuff? All right. The test of your gift. All gifts will be tested for authenticity. In other words, when you start releasing your gift, get ready for hell to break loose. Can I say it again? All gifts will be tested. When you decide to become a deployed person, your enemies wake up. So just get ready for the fight. Testing is to prove your commitment and your dedication to your gift. Didn't, you know, that's, that's the way life is. In other words, a tested vision will be trusted. People will trust you for what you survive. So you will never be completely accepted until you're being completely rejected. When you decide to stop being employed and decide to be deployed, all your enemies wake up. So you've got to be ready for the fight and stay focused. That's why it's hard to do what you're doing, son. Because what you're doing ain't nobody doing. And you wonder why it's so hard. You got to keep, wake after five. Sometimes, sometimes you got to get a job while you're waking on it. Why? Because you got to keep waking on it. You got to pay your bills, but you got to keep working on it. Because there will be tests. And let me tell you, the good news is the test doesn't come to destroy your gift. It comes to prove your gift. Never trust a person who didn't go through the test. You don't trust a product that hasn't been tested. Your credibility comes from the crisis. So we want people who are not afraid to bring their gift out. You know, when you start working in your house at night after 5 o'clock and your family comes to visit you, girl, what you doing? Boy, what you doing? I working on my gift. What you talking about, boy? You better go rest yourself. You wake all day. And they start talking you out of it. That's the way it is in life. Today, my family all support me. They all agreed with me. Some of them worked for me. But when I first started, none of them understood me. Because when you start deploying yourself, you will be tested. Tell your neighbor, get ready for the test. All right. So how do you then become successful? The four principles are here. It's found in first book of Moses, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And I wanted to bring it to this because this is the heart of success. Every company in the world uses this program. It's God's kingdom system. Genesis 128. Now if you read Genesis 126, it tells you what you're supposed to do. The Bible says, and God created man in his own image, his likeness, to have what? 
dominion, okay, over the earth. Verse 27 says, so God created them male and female and blessed them and said, have dominion. So that means both male and female, same instructions, have dominion. Now, God is a good God. He knows what he made. He knows why he made it. But he also tells it how to produce it. Remember now, he said, I can give you what? The ability to produce the wealth. So verse 28 is God's giving you the strategy to dominate. Oh boy, help me. So God is saying, look, I don't just want to tell you what to do. I'm going to show you how to do it. He says, the Lord blessed them and said unto them, what is God doing? He's talking. Who is he talking to? Humans. What's he saying to them? Instructions. And he's giving them instructions for what? To learn how to dominate in the earth. So you got to follow the instructions. This is not funny. This is the most important instruction in the world. He says, first of all, be fruitful. Secondly, multiply. Third, replenish. Four, subdue. And what's the last line? And then you'll have dominion. You were born to dominate in an area of gifting that people will pay you to do. I repeat, you were born to dominate in an area of life that people are supposed to pay you to do it. I repeat, you are supposed to dominate in an area of life that people are supposed to beat the door down to get to you, to pay you to do it. And here's how it happens. God gave us a secret. Now, I must be honest with you. The people of the world have done this more successfully than the people in the body of Christ. Matter of fact, the world has stolen God's principles and applied them more effectively than the people who claim they got the light. Let me quote, write this down, please. Luke chapter 11, verse 16. It says, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Therefore, go to the world, I'm quoting Jesus, and learn from them that you may have riches in this life and the life to come. I am quoting Jesus. Please listen to me. He said, look, go to the world. Why? The children of, the children of this world, the children of this world, that means the world system, are wiser, he says, than the children of light. The word wise means to apply. They are applying my principles more effectively than you who showed them speaking in tongues. He says, so don't despise them, don't get mad at them, and don't get jealous of them. Go to them, he says, and learn from them. That's in the Bible. Now, here's the problem. You've been taught by your religious background, stay away from them. Christ comes says, go keep company with them and learn what they're doing. Why? Because they're applying what I taught you better than you applying it because you don't even know it and they know it and that's why they're success. They're employing you. How come you work for a sinner? Because laws have no respect for whether you're saved or unsaved. <laughs> you keep the law, you get the results. Huh? He says, go to them. They've learned my principles. They have figured it out. They are more successful. Now, tell me one of them who didn't follow God's plan. And I'm going to give you the plan right now. Number one, he said, be fruitful. The word fruitful in Hebrew means to be a producer, to produce something. Be fruitful doesn't mean to have children. The Hebrew word means to produce. What do you think a fruit is? It's produce. That means what was on the inside of the tree has come out. Be fruitful. He didn't say go looking for fruit. Which means the fruit exists. Huh. Be productive. And then he says now that you produce a fruit, 
Let me use myself as an example. This is my book. I wrote this. This is mine. It says here, USA Today bestseller. That means millions, you know, sold. Okay. I stayed up while you were sleeping and produced this. It took me months and months to produce this. Hard work. I'm doing two books right now. I've been doing them for the last six months. One will be finished in November. The other one will be finished not until April next year. What are you doing? So when I go home after I leave it tonight, I don't go to bed. My wife will tell you, I work. My fruit came out of me, my fruit. Now, here's the problem. This is my fruit. Can this make me wealthy? No. No. Only got one. I got one. So God says, go to the next level. Multiply. So I got to find a way to take the manuscript that I had, which was my fruit, and put it in a stage where it can be multiplied a million times. A manuscript is a fruit. A book is when you multiply it. Now I have thousands of them. But let me ask another question. If I got a thousand books stuck away in my garage, am I still wealthy? No, I still broke. Matter of fact, I owe the publisher plenty of money. So multiplying is not enough. Third level, replenish means to distribute. That means I got to get the books out of my warehouse and get them in the hands of people. Okay, now I got my books out and I sell 3,000. Am I a worldwide author yet? No. Because 3,000 gone, which only 3,000 people get. That's even you know, less than 10% of our population. So I got to do something else. I got to move to the fourth level. I got to subdue. Subdue means to control the market. Hmm. Control the market means when you start distributing your product, it becomes the most important one in the market. So that when people think of it, they think of you. Let me give an example. What is McDonald's known for? Big Mac. Interesting, Big Mac. They sell all kinds of but Big Mac is their fruit. Can you buy a Big Mac everywhere? No. So they got you cornered. You can't even make it at home. You can buy the bread, the burger, the onions, and you still can't make a Big Mac. Because they have refined it. Remember, refined the gift? There's a system that they have. You can never get a Big Mac in your house. You can never make it. It never tastes like it. Okay, so we got a Big Mac. What's the problem? I'm still poor. So I got to find a way to multiply the Big Mac. So I got to have what we call uh, machines or you know, people to help make the same burger according to the system. You cannot work for McDonald's and make your own burger in the kitchen. They train you how to make their burger. Why? They want consistency of the same quality. Okay, so now we, we multiply it. But now we want to what? Distribute. So they create what? Franchises. A franchise is McDonald's distributing its Big Mac. Now, they have become so widely distributed that they have subdued the market on Big Mac. Nobody got a Big Mac. You want a Big Mac? You drive past Burger King. You drive past KFC. You drive past Wendy's. Why? Because no one got a Big Mac. Is anyone driving past anyone to get to you? You know, I get all these invitations from all over the world. I say, why are they inviting me on a little island seven miles wide when they got 300 million people in America? Somehow, I develop a Big Mac that they can't find nowhere else. I am here to help you go into your closet and find your Big Mac. Everybody makes burgers. Nobody makes a Big Mac. Now we got Burger King. What they got? Whopper. They say, we don't need no Big Mac. We got our Whopper. 
They will whoop you. They're the only ones who can whoop you. No one else can whoop anybody except Burger King. Am I right? You want a whopper? You can't even make it in your own house. They got a system. They what? Refined it. It's their fruit. They produced it, and now they multiply it, and now they're distributing it, and they subdue the whopper market. You want a whopper? You drive past everybody. You will leave your home and drive miles if you want a whopper. Why? Because they're the only ones with the whopper. They subdue. They control the market. What do you control yet? I remember I got a call from T.D. Jakes a few years ago. T.D. Jakes says, look, Dr. Monroe, we are in a meeting here in Dallas, and uh, we're discussing a leadership cruise, and, and the first name that came up was yours. Let me tell you why that's important. Christ says, if you, if you want to be great, <laughs> he says, serve your gift to the world. Then he says, if you want to be first, become a slave your gift hmm. Comprende? if you want to be what first that means the first one they think of That's right. what do you do you can become a slave in the night to your gift what are you working on all night you know yes you know my, my captain here so he said, I mean pilot extraordinaire I never get rid of this guy he'd have to leave me why? This guy has refined his gift. Hmm. What do you have that people will run you down to get? What you're hearing tonight, no one in the Bible has ever told you. They just told you, get a job. And you know you can't live the way you're living for the next 40 years to try to feed your kids. Take them through college. What you doing can't pay their college rent. You got to find something. And God is saying, I'm telling you what it is. You got to find your gift. Get your Big Mac. Make yourself valuable. Subdue the market. Apple computers. Announcement two days ago, right? 48 hours ago, they said, My, uh, Apple is the... What is this? The, the most successful enterprise in history. $600 billion profit. And the guy dead. What did he do? He made one computer. Apple. What's your Big Mac? I want you to go home and think about what is it that I got a passion for? Once you produce a fruit, God gives you wisdom to multiply it. He will find you distributors and you subdue a part of the market where they got to come to you. You know, uh, in, in a few weeks, I'm going to be calling all the business people together, okay? Y'all know mine, right? I want to have just one day with the business people. I'm going to give you some secrets that they pay me for. I can give it to you free. I'm going to show you how to make your business go to the next level. You blow everybody's mind. I'm going to give you a way to become so different that everybody will find you in the middle of a crisis. You have to learn that everybody doing what you're doing. So you can't do it the way they do it. Anybody making burgers? You know why we like dirties? Dirties got a way to fix chicken. Am I talking right? I mean, you try to fix that home. You, you, could, you could buy the paper bag, take it home, you know, put it in. The, the thing still ain't got the taste. Why? I think they got some old grease in there that, that does something. That, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and they keep that grease for a few days. You, gotta, you, gotta, you need old grease to get that taste. I don't know, they're doing something, but it's unique. <laughs> what makes you different? The result is what? You have dominion. Dominion means to impact the environment. I went on Google today, sitting in my office with one of our workers. I Googled my name. 295,000 results. That's on the first page. Wow. Most of them are stores with my product. Amazon, Miles Monroe. Look at the stars next to my name and my books. Four stars, five stars. That means these are top sellers. My distribution system. I'm not teaching you something I haven't done. And I'm not different from you. I, I live right around the corner. And I was born in Bain Town. But they never taught me this. 
That's why I'm teaching you. We've been a victim of this thing that says it's a crisis. Ain't no crisis. It's a crisis of thinking. Go home and find your gift. Some of the wealthiest people in the world are sitting in your chair right now. Tell your neighbor, think. Here we go. God never told us to be seedful. What does that mean? That means that he has already assumed that you got seed. He said to be what? Fruitful. Fruit comes from seed. So God is saying, look, I'm not telling you to go look for seed. You already got it. I want you to produce something. That means that the seed is, is within you already. It has life in itself. And you possess the fruit that you're supposed to prosper from. That means that your seed possessed the fruit. But fruit is never for the tree. I've never seen a tree eat its own fruit. Have you? When you were born with a fruit, it was never for you. It was for us. The problem is we can't find you to get the fruit. And by the way, you never see a tree bringing its fruit to you. When a tree bears its fruit, everyone is attracted to it. You know, dentists don't advertise, you know. Lawyers don't advertise. They don't advertise much. They, they, why? They got their fruit, man. You, you, you'll find them. When you see a mango tree across the fence, laden down with ripe mangoes, all kind of anointing thoughts come into your mind. This fence is in the way. Right? And you will do some things to get to the tree. In other words, the tree simply produces fruit and the clients find the tree. I have never invited myself anywhere to speak. Whether it's a bank or Harvard University or any organization, any church anywhere, never have I ever once invited myself anywhere. They came looking for the fruit. Make me come to you. Please make me come to you. Give me something that I have to come to you for. Is this good? Number six, seeds need the right environment. Uh, I am going to South Africa tomorrow. And when I come back next week, I think I'm going to meet with you one more time. Because you need to understand that you could have a good seed and still be broke. <laughs> you put a mango seed on a tiled window and leave it there for 50 years. The tree is still in the seed. Wrong environment, wrong friends, wrong books, wrong TV shows, wrong people. You, you in the wrong environment. Dr. Monroe ain't got too many friends, you know. I choose my friends very carefully. I got plenty of people around me, very few friends. Friends to me are fertilizer. You leave here and you go to your house and there's a dream killer in the house. <laughs> Let me talk you out of your dream. When you get up out talking, but you got vision, you got dream, you got seed. You got to settle down and go get, get one job and, you know, help pay these bills. And then they, when they finish with you, you go right back to your old way of thinking. You need to produce the right environment to bring forth the seed. My wife and I went to Egypt. We went to the pyramids. Walked in there. Big, bigger than this room underneath the pyramids. And there was a display of King Tut. They had just found this display. And here I am looking at King Tut. 4,000 year old bones and face. I mean, this is the Egyptian king. And in one of those glass cases, there was some seeds. And I asked the guy to talk. I said, what are they? He said, these are seeds we found in the tomb of King Tut. I said, are you kidding? He said, no, these are 4,000 year old seeds. They were petrified, you know. They were frozen in, in, in the, the desert dry heat. 
I said, are they still good? He said, well, let me tell you a story. He says that uh, we shipped these seeds to Israel, and they did tests on the seeds, and they germinated the seeds. The seeds produced the largest ears of corn and of, uh, of maize that they ever saw. I said, wait a minute. Are you telling me that four-year, 4,000-year-old seeds produce? He said, yeah. He said, they were just waiting on the right environment. How old are you? You think you're too old? You think it's it? Is that for you? Did they, did they tell you it's over? What you need is the right environment one more time. Don't ever let no one write you off. Go home, start again. The Bahamas will kill you. Get free from the Bahamian culture. They done wrote you off. You a drug addict. You a prostitute. You are divorced. They are lying. All you need is another environment again. That's all. In that seed, 4,000 years, was a plant waiting for the right environment. They never taught you this in school, hey? This should have been the first lecture you got when you went to high school. You wouldn't have been sitting around here worrying about keeping a job. And there wouldn't be a bunch of foreigners owning the Bahamas. What kind of country have we built? A country of dependents who look to a government to provide jobs. Write this down, please. Every problem is a business. You were born to solve a problem. Say it with me. I was born to solve a problem. Just give me five more minutes, okay? Because this is important. This is what your father should have taught you the last 50 years. That's why it takes so long for me to give it to you. I'm trying to save you 50 years of ignorance in one night. You have to remember that you were born to solve a problem. And that's where businesses come from. A business is simply someone solving a problem. Fast food solved the problem. You ain't got time to eat breakfast in the morning for no hour. So on your way, you stop at a window. And by the time you get to work, you had breakfast. Someone solved that problem. You know what I'm missing? Shoe shine boys. I'm missing them. My shoes need cleaning right now. I ain't got no time to clean those shoes. If you stop asking for money, think about a solution. When I saw the first massage chair in an airport, it was an Asian. I said, oh boy, something started here. Now every airport you go in got massage chairs. Why? Because people get tight when they travel. They need to relax. So someone saw a problem. Now that's a billion dollar business. Ten minute massage for ten dollars. Five thousand massages in one day. It's five hundred thousand dollars. Somebody said we can solve this problem. Why don't you go around just look in the Bahamas and look for some problems? Why? God gave you the ability and the gift to solve a problem and therefore whoever solves the problem becomes wealthy. We ain't got no poverty problems. We got blindness problems. We don't look for solutions to problems. We look for problems to complain about. Business is all around you. Why? Problems are all around you. Why do people put, you know, like those things, you know, like those kind of raster type looking to hear? 
You know what they say? They say because it's easy to fix. Just shake it and you go to work. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the natural look, I guess, is yeah. I asked my daughter, I said, daughter, why not? She said, she said I ain't got time to fix no hair in the morning. I just shake it and go to work. Someone solved the problem. We put the stuff, you know, fix it. You don't got to worry about it. That's a solution. That's not funny. That's a solution. People don't want to spend an hour in the morning fixing the hair. Don't laugh at that. You, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Study the problems. Spend the whole day tomorrow just driving around looking for problems. You'll be amazed. Businesses everywhere. Matter of fact, listen for complaints. Every complaint is a business. Say la. Lord help me. All right. Let me give you eight keys to become successful in business. One, add value to people. Added value. You sell shoes. Then you need to go back and add value to that store. You sell shoes. And you serve hot tea to every customer. That's added value. So I ain't coming for shoes no more, you know. I like the tea you're serving. I can tell everybody when you go to that store, you get tea. It ain't funny. I went to a, a massage place the other day, and we was away, and I mean these people, Lord, this was no massage place. They, they treat you like you some king or something. They, they massage you till 30 minutes later. By the, by the time they finish taking care of you, you don't want to leave. And that's their point. They want you to stay. Because they charge by the hours. You understand? They, they don't want you to come out there. Added value. Number two, be unique. <laughs> you barber? Fine. Find another way to make your barber ring different. Go away and study some new techniques. Come back and say, I'm the only one who got this technique. Or when you come to us, we, we, we serve you cookies and rice or something. In other words, you, you make something unique about you. Thirdly, quality. How, how, how high a quality? Sometimes quality alone is enough, you know. You sell shoes. That one, that one sells good shoes. They sell better shoes. See, it depends on the quality. Four, attention to details. Come on in, Dr. Monroe. What kind of tea do you like? Hey, I only want to buy a dress. What kind of tea do you like? Yes, and they serve me in a silver cup. Spoon of gold. I only want to drink the tea. Quality. Details. Some of y'all can never make it in some expensive restaurants. Why? You take the napkin, put it on your lap. The fellow says, no, 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 don't touch that. The detail is, I put it on your lap for you. That's a little detail, but it makes everything different. It's good for business. Four, always offer extra. Always find something extra to give someone. That makes you different. We went to a bank in Florida last week, walking there. And they said, come on in, come on in, come on in. Uh, would you like some candies? I don't want no candies. But that's, they, they offering candy right away, a little extra. We don't want to know what you come for yet. We want to give you something. A little extra. Them candies probably cost, you know, a fraction of a cent each. But it keeps the customer coming. That's worth thousands. Number six, service. Service means you don't try to play down here. <laughs> service. That's a whole new ball game. And then I, I, the power of identifying people's needs. Find what people need. 
That's why you become a good business leader. What are the needs? Needs change. Sometimes people come to you and they, they complain about something that you ain't doing. Take that seriously. They're telling you about a need that ain't being meant. And then number eight, be interested in people. Don't be interested in the bottom line trying to make money. Be interested in people. They'll be interested in you. Sometimes you got to lose something to keep a customer. Lose it. Because things don't come from feelings and hurt. They come from customers. <laughs> All right. Big line. How do you find your gift? I thought you'd wait for this one. Number one, how do you find your gift? How do you know what you were born to do? How do you know the thing that's supposed to make you wealthy? Number one, ask yourself these questions. What is my greatest desire? Go home and study that, please. Take this CD and listen to it. Number two, what do I wish for humanity? Take a bit of M, please. Have you ever sat down and says, I wish somebody would just do this. I wish somebody would just do that. That is your destiny screaming. Why don't somebody do this? In other words, whatever you complain about is what you were born to fix. Number three, what makes you angry? Your gift will always make you angry. It is the thing that makes you angry that you were born to change. If you are get angry at shabby work, I mean, you're supposed to produce best work. You get angry at young people on the street, that means your gift is to go and save young people. Whatever makes you angry is a sign of what you were born to do. Every successful person was an angry person. All of them. Nelson Mandela was angry. So he couldn't be a lawyer anymore. His anger made him leave law and send him to jail. Mahatma Gandhi was angry. He was a lawyer too. Quit law and saved the whole nation, India. Mother Teresa was a teacher, high school teacher. She became angry at poverty in India. Left it, couldn't handle it anymore. Took her last paycheck and bought groceries and gave it to a leper. What makes you angry? Martin Luther King Jr., angry. He was just a preacher, a pastor. His anger drove him into his gift. Marlon B. Butler Jr., what made him angry? Marlon Butler, he grabbed that and makes it, this, this, I am tired of this. Threw it out of the window. Anger. Free the people. You know what the problem is? You ain't angry enough. Write this down. You will never change what you tolerate. What did I say? I want you to remember that. As long as you tolerate it, you won't change it. You've got to get to the point where you can't handle it no more. You know, my anger at third world oppression is what created Miles Monroe. I hate oppression of the people in third world. Whether they're black or white or Asian or Latin, I, I hate it. I hate oppression. I hate it. That's what gave me birth. And I saw what the colonial powers did to my mind. I said, I hate it. And that hatred produced me. What makes you angry? That's why I say I will transform followers into leaders. Why? Because we were born to be leaders, but they told us you were born to be a slave. That anger is what created this ministry. What makes you angry? Don't look for a job. Look for your anger. What is your deepest passion? Passion means what do you want to do and never stop doing? Got to find it. Look at number six. Number five, what do you talk, think about when you are alone? Normally, when you are finally quiet and alone, that's when your gift starts talking. You know why you can't find your gift? You with people too much. You got TV on too much. Listen to music too much. Everyone in history, you check them out, who heard their, their gift was alone. Moses, mountain. Jesus, in the hills. Uh, uh, Elijah, in the cave. Where, where do you hear? We too noisy. Always with friends. Anyway, let's go. Let's, nobody mean let's go. Go alone and listen to your spirit. You'll find your gift. 
And your gift is where your wealth is, remember. You don't find your gift among friends. You find it among God. Have you ever taken a walk by yourself for a long time? No, you haven't. You always want people with you. Let's go for a walk. No, no, no. Why don't you just go by yourself? Just go by yourself. I say, Lord, me and you going on a gift-finding walk. Be too noisy. What do you think about when you're alone? The question is, are you ever alone? Some of my greatest revelations come in the shower. Why? Ain't nobody in there with me. It's me in the water. God could talk to me. No music, no radio, no talk shows, all this foolishness. I gotta, I gotta hear. That's why my, my life. Be careful, they talk shows. They will talk you out of your gift. Shut them off. They rob you of your destiny. And they never solve problems. Number six, what do you wish you could change in your country? If you walk around your country complaining about something that you could change, you were probably born to fix it. Number seven, what would you do if there was no limit to money and resources? What would you spend it on? What would you really do if you had all the money that you could find? Whatever that answer is, that's what you were born to do. And guess what? If you refine it and document it and begin to develop it, the money will come to it. Because there's somebody born to finance your dream. The trouble is they can't find it. They can't find the tree. <laughs> Eight, what is your natural gift? Number nine, what would you do without compensation? It's a tough one. Whatever you were born to do is something that you could do and never get paid for it and still be happy. This is why most people are poor, you know. They want to get paid for everything. People who change the world and who become effective never do anything for money. They do it because they love the passion of it. Bill Gates was interested in no money. He wanted to solve the problem of this massive computer that took up a whole room. He said, there's got to be a way to bring DOS, DOS, DOS for them DOS things to, in a simple icon. And the guy said, I'm going to do it. What no money is concerned about? What are you passionate about? People come to Dr. Munro, I'd like to be like you. I want to learn to teach and, you know, be a public speaker. I say, okay, uh, volunteer to work in the children's church in BFM. Oh, no, 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 I won't be a public speaker. I just give you the answer volunteer to go talk to the kids every Sunday. Why? Practice on them. They know when you make a mistake. What you want is you want the money I get. I started teaching Sunday school for nothing. I taught thousands of conferences for nothing. Why? I was refining my gift. I wasn't looking for compensation. You want to be successful? Do it for nothing. Serve your gift. Volunteer. That's how you become great. <laughs> I was talking to one of our IT people today, a young lady. I know she's here. And she said, I said, how long have you been working? She said, I've been working here since 19, sorry, 2008. She said, but you know, Pastor Miles, I used to come here for five years and just volunteer. And one day they just said, you know what you're doing. Why aren't you coming to staff? Now she's working in one of the leaders in IT. Would you do that? Or you won't pay the first day? Volunteer. What would you do? And personally sacrifice for it. You normally, when you find your gift, you're willing to put up your house for the business. You're willing to sacrifice the car to invest it in the, in, in the idea. That's sacrifice. When we built Bahamas Faith Ministries, I'm telling you what, man, <laughs> we have nothing. My wife and I had one car. We used to share it. I used to live with my mother-in-law in one room in the house. Why? We ain't, ain't got no money to waste. Are you too proud to live with your mother-in-law? 
so you could save money, so you can put it invested in, 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 in the idea. No. What are you willing to sacrifice? See, some people are willing to die, you know. That's what makes them so powerful. Nelson Mandela was willing to die. Sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice for your idea? You may have to sell your house. <laughs> and you read history, these guys, all these big guys you're so you know, jealous of, check them out. They started selling their houses, selling their cars for their idea. They had to sacrifice something because they believed in it more than their own security. Success is, and prosperity ain't, a, ain't, ain't magic. It's laws. These are laws. Uh, I was thinking about this year. Find your purpose, find your perception, find your potential, discover your passion, your, live by the principles, create, create a plan, be with the right people who can influence you to get there. That means choose your friends. Be persistent, because there can be fight. There'll be a fight against it. And then you have to be persevering all the time because you got to fight your way to your success. And then, pray. Always spend time with God. He's the one who gave you the plan. You're going to make it happen. I had a, a, a final slide here. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you. Look at number seven. Write number seven down. Serve your gift free at every opportunity. I did that. I did it. Serve your gift free. The more you serve it, the more value you're building. And the day can come and someone's going to say, you know something, I like what you're doing. We're going to finance your program for the next 10 years. But there's watching you, you see. Serve your gift free at every opportunity. In other words, the greatest act of your prosperity is volunteerism. Volunteer your gift. They'll pay you later. Sign up to serve. You get paid later. It happens to everybody. I love you. I don't want you to fail. I know it's been long, but it's so dangerous out there. You better get this in here. Life is rough out there. I don't want you to be a beggar. You're a great woman. You're an awesome man. You got more on the inside of you that they haven't seen yet. You are not finished. You're still on your way. Wake yourself up. Dust yourself off. Let's go get them. Let's go and become successful without even seeking it. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.